uh, we used to come into New York City a lot, and my mother took uh, music lessons uh, by Madame Leonard, a famous teacher in Juilliard School of Music. Anyway, so we always used to come in the city, and the, me and my brother and sister, and my father. And so during that lesson time, which was about two hours on Saturday, we always went to uh, the Museum of Natural History, about twice a month. Always went to the same rooms, everything. And in the African room, I don't believe it's there anymore. This last time I, I went there, I didn't see it. They had this thing they called, they had, you know, had stuffed animals set in different ways. This scenario was called the salt lick. Now, if you're familiar with that, there's certain places where, well, you know all animals need salt, and there's certain water uh, pools in the African Serengeti and all that that had a, a high quotient of uh, salt in it. And the interesting thing about salt lick, as you read the little thing underneath, written by some guy, and all these stuffed animals, there was like a, a lion there, and a gazelle there, and a this there, and a that there. Animals that don't get along at all. But the deal is, they all need salt. And they have some kind of a uh, innate truce. Now, you, you can be sure they're looking. I mean, you know, well, the lion's licking. He, his eyes are going, <laughs> looking for a gazelle, and the gazelle is, uh, you know, ready to jump any moment. But they all go to the lick because they all need salt. And that's what they all have in common. It reminds me of the Christians. You know, they come from the northeast, southwest, they're all different, but they come to the same salt lick, which here in our apartment is the candy bowl. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Only Phil is a non-animal type. I've never seen him at that salt lick. But everybody else just goes in there. We have to drag you back. Thank you for your prayers. This weekend I was away and I spoke uh, three times um, at, a, at a fellowship where people really love the Lord. They, they're, they're your cousins, the country mouse. They live out there about 120 miles from here, out on the end of the island. And they just lost some of their most beloved people. They just died to cancer. So I went out there to share with them. So thankful for life. So I shared, my message was out of devastation. God recovers glorious things. That's, that's what I shared about. And maybe think as we were singing songs. I'm not talking about what I'm going to talk about yet. I, I'm off the topic. Um, when we sang in an en endless song of praise, if you look at the end of it, it says copyright unknown. Well, I'll tell you who she is. Her name's Lisa. And she was a girl about your age, if you're 30-ish. And she was in a, a, an Episcopalian church on Long Island in Malvern. And she was living in the uh, marriage cocktail called On the Rocks. Until, in a wonderful way, she met this uh, spirit-filled pastor who, uh, through whom she was saved. It saved her marriage. And she was only a Christian about one year when she wrote in an endless song of praise. But just to let you know, you know, some of you have that kind of thing in you. And you should express your love for the Lord. <laughs> that was about 1983 or 4. Was that before you were born? Most of you weren't around then, were you? <laughs> well, let me go back just a couple more years since I'm on the topic and totally wasting time. Back in 1980... I remember a young man who came uh, to our fellowship uh, out on Long Island. This was in uh, <clears throat> Hicksville. And he came, he looked kind of scruffy and everything. He came to our meetings, and we were meeting in the church basement. And uh, one day, uh, we didn't have a piano player, and he said, oh, I'll play piano. And boy, he really played piano real well. But he really looked scruffy. We found out he was living in a potter shed in some nursery here trying to get his life back together again because he'd just been divorced. And he left Arizona and all that he had, he left with his wife back there. And he came with nothing. He was sleeping in a potter shed. He just had, you know, one pair of jeans. But we helped him out. And he found some healing in the Lord in the midst of the devastation. And he's the guy who wrote, You are my hiding place. He wrote it that year. As a matter of fact, while he was still there with us in Hicksville, stayed six months. Went back out to the West Coast. He's now happily married. 1981, he copyrighted that song. Probably made a million dollars off it. But he came out of devastation. And out of devastation, sometimes we learn things. 
really seminal things, important things about life. The trouble with fast pace is we often skid along in some kind of a shallow, by the seat of our pants, choom, 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 and we don't touch deeper things. So today I just want to touch, and, and I want to give you one, one more story, but I want to touch on this deeper thing that I talked about last time, but since you're all ducks, the water rolled off your back. Now it's time for me once again to irk you as the gadfly of Manhattan regarding Shabbat. If you don't know what Shabbat is, it's Sabbath. Okay? So you didn't hear me the first time. Once again, I want to plunge you into the world of the unknown and talk about observing Shabbat. Okay? Let's turn to Isaiah 58, where we see a prophetic uh, word regarding the importance of it. And then since we're in a sort of a semi-Shabbat, since uh, Shmuel's and Leandra's wedding, I'm going to tie it into Isaiah 62, which I preached. Well, you could hardly call it preached. What did I speak? Four minutes at the wedding? But anyway, there we go. Isaiah 58, verse 13. There's two words connected with Shabbat. The most frequent one, not, not in this passage. Uh, the first, the first word that's connected with Shabbat all the time is what? Anybody know the Hebrew word? Shalom. So the uh, so the, he, the Jews say to one another, Shabbat Shalom, because it's at in Sabbath that you find your peace, your Shalom. So let me teach you a little Hebrew here. I'm getting this mic fixed up. Next time you see Sammy, how about saying this to him? Ma. Shalom, that's shalom. Shalom, ha. <laughs> Got to be more like a lion. <laughs> Ma shalom ha. That, that's how you say uh, hi to somebody in uh, Israel. It means, how is your peace? And that's probably what we should say to one another as well. What do you think? Ma shalom ha. How is your peace? All right. Now, so shalom is one of the common words that's stuck together with Shabbat because that's one of the reasons the Jews loved Sabbath. There was peace. No television. No texting. A true Orthodox Jew will not do any of those things. They are looking for shalom. Now, of course, the Jews observed the Sabbath day and they made it an outward thing, a thing they must do. And so isn't it one of the funniest things to stand over here on the, east, on the west side of Williamsburg Bridge about sunset on Friday. Have you ever seen it? It's just one of the most amazing things. There's Orthodox people flying across the bridge, uh, walking, of course, and mothers with their baby carriages going as fast as they can to try to get over on the other side to Williamsburg before sunset when, sh when Shabbat takes place, when they're supposed to be indoors. And the sun is slowly sinking, and they're running like crazy to get to Shabbat so you can rest. <laughs> Diligently, earnestly, they're trying to enter into their rest. Go there. Watch the Williamsburg Bridge. You know, there's such a, a large Orthodox community on the other side of the bridge. And they're all running for Shabbat before the sun sets. Otherwise, they get in trouble. All right. All right. Verse 13. If because of Shabbat you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Shabbat a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word. Then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. And I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How's your Shabbat? Do you take seriously that... Among the Orthodox Jews, for some strange reason, out of all Ten Commandments, this is their most important commandment. To break Shabbat is, is the great sin. And it should be among Christians as well. For any Christian not to be entered into the rest is just a sin against your own life. You are in self-destruct mode if you're not observing Shabbat. Now, have you thought about Shabbat lately? 
like about Sabbath. I spoke on it about a month, uh, two months ago maybe, and you've probably forgotten already. It's more important not what you remember what I said, but have you entered into it? Do you remember Shabbat uh, last Saturday? Yeah, and Isaiah chapter 62. And here's something else that connects with this. Hmm, I wonder if you remember this. Verse 4. The land will no longer be called forsaken, nor will the land be called desolate, but your land will be called Hepzibah. My, my delight is in her, and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over a bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Did you catch the second word connected with Shabbat? Now we got Shalom. It's kind of like the fruit of it. What's the essence of Shabbat? Did you catch it from Isaiah 58? Did you catch it from 62? There's another connecting word. Right. The ligatan. Otherwise called the light. Did you notice that as it came up in Isaiah 58? Do you see it here? My delight is in her. For I delight in you. What is the Sabbath? It's not a day. It's not something outward, although it's outward to this extent. If you go back to Isaiah 58, which I won't cover because you're smart enough to already pick it up. Shabbat involves a desisting from yourself, from your words, from your thoughts, from your deeds. Did you see all that? He who desists from doing that and desists from doing this... Now he is able to delight thyself in the Sabbath. It's, let's go back there, okay? I, I think probably I've already thrown so many curveballs you don't remember. Um, so, verse 13. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, now there you go. So the movie's out on the Sabbath. <laughs> Uh, and you call the Shabbat a delight. Delight, which comes from the word delicious. Something I'm, I'm hoping that Cole will speak upon very soon. Delicatessen means eating delicacies. You should go to the delicatessen every Shabbat. If you'll call the Shabbat a delight, you see, and you honor it, desisting from your own ways and seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord and I am happy, says the Lord. And you will ride on the top of the heaven. You need money, you got it. You got a problem, it's solved. Now you see, that's the way it originally was because Adam, of course, was created on the sixth day and then Adam says, okay, Lord, what do we need to do? Lord says, well, let's see, you're one day old, let's start life out with Shabbat. And so he made the seventh day holy, and he said, here's what we got to do. It's a very important, Adam. Adam says, yeah, what's that? He says, let's go walk in the park and see all that I've already finished and done for you. I want you to see creation. I want you to see the animals. I want you to see the trees. I want you to be a restful observer and a delighter. Uh, when you go, ah, I want to go, ah. And so God wanted to spend an eternity with Adam going, ah, naming animals. Ooh, that's an ooga, that's an ooga. I don't know uh, Adam's language. God delights when man delights. But man's too fast to delight. Delight takes some time. You don't go into Nathan's and expect a delight. It's just consumer food, which I happen to love very much, especially the potatoes. But that's another subject. <laughs> you don't expect a delight in that. And if you're going to some place that's full of delicacies, like some dear saints here gave Julie and I some kind of gift certificate, and we went to a place of delicacies. Now you just don't eat there in 12 minutes, standing on your feet. 
sit down, they bring in the courses, they open a little thing, they explain, this is made with the juju sauce, they roasted it for 19 days, and you go, that was it. <laughs> you delight. It takes some time. So here you go. Can I give you a simple definition? If you're not taking time to lighten in the Lord, you're, you're missing the whole business of your life. Because the thing about delighting is, the thing about Sabbath is, although you should have many goals in your life, here is a goal that's already standing in front of you. You can do it already. From the moment you're born again, you entered into his rest. Now delight in that. See, we, That's what we try to do when we come together and break bread. I, I hope you delight in that. I, I hope you don't feel like, oh, I, I, do, I, do I have to say something? Do I have to pray something? Oh, no, what, what song? Uh, 36 or 94? I don't know. Which one? Which one, Lord? Uh, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. The Lord's heart is an open book for people who truly think consider God a delicacy. And especially because we've seen Jesus Christ as the delicacy of delicacies. Delight yourself in him. Talk to him. First name basis. Let it be known. The, the Lord loves intimacy. He's more comfortable with it, obvious, than we are. So don't just, you know, do that kind of quick rattle off Devo in the morning. You may have to do that quick Devo in the morning. It's okay. But is there some time when you can go for a walk in the park with the Lord. Where's your favorite spot to meet the Lord? Do you have one? I, I have one. I, I'll admit it to you. And I, I'm not, so I'm not talking about a daily thing. I love the ocean. I meet God at the ocean. I, I really do. Something about the waves and the power of the whole thing. It just, I love it. So I'm out there for the weekend and I get an hour break. I went to the water and listened to the waves. And I met God. I, I, I really didn't say anything. I mean, when you're delighting, you don't have to carry a conversation. You know? Oh, God, what do you think about this? You know, I've been I, I wanted to ask you about Shabbat, Shabbat, Shalom, delight. Delight yourself in the Lord. That's keeping the Sabbath in the simplest way. The only thing that's tough about it is, once again, we have to desist from this and desist from that and desist from this. The whole list. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Hi, God. Eh? What have I got, an angel over my head? What, what's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the deal. The, the kickback. You delight yourself in the Lord in one day, and I think for some of you already come there, but some of you haven't yet. Delight yourself in the Lord, and one day you'll hear him say, I delight in you. Hepzibah. Now that's what the groom says to the bride. That's what we talked about at the wedding. Hepzibah. My delight is in you. Have you ever felt the Lord say that to you? It's a life changer. We're, we're always saying, well, you know, I must delight myself in the Lord. I know it's right. I know I should. I know he's worthy. I, one day soon, next tomorrow morning, yeah, I'm going to delight my... I, I ought to. I should. I bet. Just delight yourself in the Lord. Can you do it? One day, he'll say, you're my delight. It, it's actually the truth now, but you can't receive it because you're too ashamed of yourself. You just can't take it in. So I end with a story. Back about three weeks ago, I went down to a men's retreat. You guys know I've been going there for 32 years. And as a brother, he's been there for 32 years, and his name is Joe, and he's an electrician. And he comes up from a Baltimore church. He's faithful to the Lord. I, I'm sure he's an elder in the church or a deacon. Loves the Lord, has seven kids. And brothers and sisters, I recommend seven kids. You should not just stop at two or that old Chinese malaise of one. Seven kids. Joe had seven kids, five daughters, and the last two were sons. They've all grown up. But when you have seven kids, here's what you have. You have blessings and you have tragedies. That's what happens. One of the kids may not make it, you know. But it's worth loving somebody, even if they go. than never having loved at all. And saying, well, aren't I safe? I've never had children. I'm fine. 
Better to have seven kids and four of them die. Your life will be richer for it. Anyway, old Joe, he had seven kids. He's, he's, a, he's a kind of a, well, I don't want to pick out somebody in this group, but he's a, he's a sort of a curmudgeon, you know. He's a, kind of a quiet guy. He really knows the Lord. He's been going to Bible studies for years. I mean, he really knows the Lord. And he got up and shared testimony Saturday, three weeks ago, whatever it was. And he says, you know what? He says, I've been hearing this message about Christ and you and you and Christ and living in there and living in that peace. He says, you know, I've been listening and I've been believing, I've been trusting, I've been saying. And I know that I love the Lord. I, I know that I love the Lord and he's kept me and he's been gracious to me. But I, I, I just had a hard time with the Lord loving me. Just grasping that. I can't get my hands around it. I, I, I don't feel like I measure up. Because he's not a preacher. You know, he, as you know, the only holy men of God are preachers. He felt that he didn't measure up. He's from a Methodist church. And then he told a story. So the last two boys, the one boy now uh, is about, uh, must be 19. I think he's finishing up high school this, this year. And a boy under him is completely autistic. Not only autistic, violent, the worst kind. It was his favorite kid, his youngest, and at two years old, he used to pitch the little wiffle ball to him down in the basement. He's got pictures of this boy with a Baltimore Orioles hat on, and the boy was swinging and laughing and talking and walking and everything. By the time the boy was six, he couldn't do what he did when he was two. By the time he was 12, he couldn't do what he was doing at six. By the time he's 18 now, he's a violent boy, can't even hold his own bowels and stuff, and he throws his feces all over the room. He beats up on his father. Anyway, he, he came because he wanted to tell us that the doctor said you have to institutionalize him. You can't keep him at home. It's just not even safe for your wife, nor is it safe for your, da your daughters if they come home from college and various things. And Joe was broken hard. He uh, went on a retreat with his graduating son. And this Methodist place went out and they had a retreat, a camp retreat. And, and, and this one of those retreats where you write letters to one another. Ever, you, ever you've been on one of those trips? Some retreats are to get you to talk to each other. And this was a father-son retreat. Now, you know fathers and sons don't talk <laughs> until the son turns 30. Then he says, hey, Dad, where were you? <laughs> so they go out on this retreat where father and son get to write a letter to each other. Joe gets the letter from his son. And the son says, Dad, I'll just put it in the words he said. I don't know how the hell you do it. Every day, your son beats the crap out of you, throws crap at you. And yet I see you every afternoon awaiting him coming back on the bus, looking out the window. And when you see him, your eyes light up. And Dad, I don't get it. And Joe understood that moment that the Lord delighted in him. Because that's the way the Lord is to us. We throw our tantrums and our crap all over the place. And the Lord's looking out the window. And he can't wait to meet with you and I. And Joe had a breakthrough. And through a flood of tears, he said, the Lord delights in me. It was so beautiful. And it was so true. A man of few words just showed us how God reaches a faithful person's heart. I hope you delight in the Lord. You know, he can't force it on you. I can't ask you to do it. But for goodness sake, what a wonderful Lord we have. Can you spend some time with him? Just single syllable words of love. And one day, you'll hear something like Joe. And through his son's letter, he understood. The Lord delights in me. I, I didn't even realize I was doing that. I, I was looking out the window, and I was so happy to see my son. And I'd go out there and try to grab him and take him off the bus, and he'd wrestle me and fight me all the way back into the house. And we'd have to pin him down to get his clothes off to change him. And then he'd just slop all over the place and spit up his food and do the whole thing. And he said, I delight in my son. I love him so much. And the Lord 
delights in us. Lord, I pray that heaven will open for all of us who observe Shabbat. It will not only know the peace of walking and talking with you, but that one day you might speak that ever gracious, overwhelming word of captivity to us. My daughter, I delight in you. My son, I delight in you. And there is a love that goes beyond any love of marriage or friendship, bond of brother or sister, a delight. Lord, we see reason why we would delight in you. Sometimes we're baffled at the reverse. But we want to stand in Sabbath ground and discover enough about you that the rest of life becomes an outpouring of response when we discovered the depth of your love. Help us all enjoy Shabbat Shalom and being Hepzibah by the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. These things we pray in his name. Amen.